Hi ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. Today I have myself, I have with myself my friend Myla and she's gonna go over this specialty that is probably the coolest specialty I've heard about. It's called PMR and she would tell you everything. She's currently a resident there. So Myla, just, just take the stage and you know, let's talk to them about what's PMR, how to apply to the specialty, like and you know, what's the lifestyle like, mm -hmm. you know, everything about PMR basically that you know can even change your lives if you apply to it right let's let's start all right yeah so pmnr is physical medicine and rehabilitation another way it's called is physiatry not psychiatry but physiatry and the doctors are called physiatrists it is basically functional medicine think of it as kind of like a hybrid of all the msk stuff and joint stuff with ortho and uh, all the neuro stuff with neurology you're basically doing assessments on a patient's functional status to try to see how they're able to live their day-to-day -day life so a big key part of it is getting a solid social history things like what kind of home do they live in and are there any steps to get into their home? Or is it two stories? Is there a basement with a flight of stairs? Is it something where they work on their feet all the time, like with us healthcare workers? Or is it a little bit more sedentary? Mm -hmm. uh, you basically do a really good in-depth assessment of what's going on in their surroundings, how they move around in their day to day, and how you can best improve their quality of life and longevity. So you're basically rehabbing a lot of different things. Uh, you can deal with congenital illnesses, you can deal with neurodegenerative illnesses, injuries, uh, strokes, uh, amputations as well. So you're basically managing the rehab of a variety of things that uh, impact people's quality of life and function. So I've also heard that it's like this functional medicine uh, aspect of it, which is like a combination of ortho and neuro, mm -hmm. right? So what's that about? Okay, so what you're doing is a lot of the msk exam and also the neuro exam so your your neuroanatomy needs to be rock solid for this and what you're doing is you're doing your evaluations to see where the deficits are what the deficits are and trying to treat the symptoms related to it and trying to improve those deficits however way you can now you can do that through a variety of ways you can use a whole multitude of modalities but we're not primarily surgical Mm -hmm. There are some procedures we can do, but you're not going to be in the OR with a bone saw. <laughs> like, like what procedures can you do? Give me an example. Okay. So we do a lot of injections. So we can do steroid joint injection, epidural steroid injections into the spine. We can do nerve ablations for people who have chronic low back pain, where we can go into the nerves and actually with a Teflon tip needle burn them so that they don't cause as much problems. Uh, we can also do medication management to help with symptoms like from spasticity for people who've had strokes or brain injuries. We'll also come up with bowel and bladder programs for people who have spinal cord injuries and they have neurogenic bowels and neurogenic bladder. Some people say it's ortho without the surgery and neuro without the seizures, but that's not really accurate because when we're dealing with traumatic brain injuries and strokes, you can also be managing a seizure component through medication. That's interesting i like the way you put it like it's like ortho without the surgery and like neuro without the seizures yeah but you, right? you really still deal with the seizures you deal, deal with the seizures yeah. that's cool so you're like it's like ortho neurology mm -hmm. but chiller yeah i would definitely <laughs> say that yeah um so we are working in pretty much any environment medically you can think of. There's people who have their own cl outpatient clinics, you can be a consultant in the inpatient hospital, and we're generally like medical directors and the people running the subacute rehab hospitals, skilled nursing facility rehab programs, subacute rehab, long-term care, uh, just pretty much any facility that someone's going to be getting some therapies to get a little bit stronger, a little bit better. So, mm -hmm. So because we're familiar with all those facilities and how they run and we're generally running them, we're actually pretty good for when it comes to discharge planning. That's one of the big roles we have when we are consultants in the hospital, figuring out where people can go. Um, a good example I can think of is, let's say you have a 65-year-old gentleman who has a knee replacement. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're talking about someone with good support, good uh, transportation options, who lives in like a one-story home without many steps to get in, maybe like one step up. This is someone who can do outpatient physical therapy and can leave the hospital, no problem. But if we're talking about someone who lives alone 
in a walk-up apartment mm -hmm. who doesn't have reliable transportation. Well, before we send them home, we're going to want them to be safe enough to move around home and not have a risk of falling or injuring themselves after a big surgery. So we'll probably send them to like a skilled nursing facility for some physical therapy. It's not just a nursing home for like old people. Uh, there's actually a big component that's part of rehab. I definitely agree because one of the most like co common causes of morbidity in the elderly is falls mm -hmm. and physical therapy like goes a long way to prevent that. Yeah. Right. And uh, so just uh, to get the gist of it, like, could you give me the typical bread and butter case that mm -hmm. BMR generally deals with? You know, like just the bread and butter case that you would, let's say, see every single week. Oh, geez. Um... Our breadth of practice is quite large. Um, yeah. I gave you a post-operative patient. Yeah, That's I... a big one. Uh, also, we do stroke evaluations. So when someone has a stroke and they're dealing with um, spasticity, they're dealing with other deficits, like maybe there's problems with communication or swallowing, uh, we'll do evaluations along with our friends in physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of come up with a plan all together for uh, the betterment of the patient. Um, a lot of times they end up in the inpatient rehab facility for a number of weeks, if not months, in order for them to get stronger, get better, and have the adaptive devices that they need. Um, I can give you an example that's really great. There was a patient that I did a case study on who had a brain injury and had a lot of spasticity issues that impacted her ability to walk. Mm -hmm. And so, in conjunction with physical therapy doing the exercises and the stretches and making sure she can safely transfer from her wheelchair into her seat or okay. the toilet, uh, the physiatrist was using Botox injections. That's They're cool therapeutic Botox injections to paralyze specific muscles that had the worst spasticity in her legs so that we can get increased mobility. So using the notes from the physical therapist, the physiatrist was able to change the therapeutic targets with the Botox and just figure out like, okay, we need to add more units of Botox to the quadriceps versus the gastrocnemius and just things like that. And working together, we're able to get the best results. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Like. Oh man, okay. Yeah. So regarding <laughs> regarding PMR, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so how long is the residency program? What does it entail? Like what's the first year like, second year like, third year like, fourth year like, and about fellowships and future uh, work opportunities. So could you please elaborate on that? Oh, exam? absolutely. Yeah. So the PMNR residency is going to be four years total. And there are two categories of residency programs. There's one that's categorical, which all four years are included. Mm -hmm. And what your first year generally looks like, it's very internal medicine heavy because you're going to be managing a lot of medications, a lot of medically complex patients, and mm -hmm. that's one of the best foundations you can do. But a lot of categorical years will, uh, categorical programs will have your first year have some surgical subspecialty time. Like uh, one of the fellows I talked to who went to UPenn, she had some time with general surgery and neurosurgery. So wow. because we have a lot of post-operative patients and a lot of patients who had devastating catastrophic injuries where you're going to see orthospine, you're going to see neurosurgery involvement, it's actually very appropriate for us to have uh, experience on their service as well. Okay. But it's not generally as heavy surgically as it is more internal medicine. I, I understand. And then there's like other like uh, specialties that you rotate like neurology is a big yep. one. Neurology is right? a big one. Yeah, and but like it's more of like a prelim IM year for you guys. Yeah, well, that's for me in particular. Yeah, actually. but different programs are different, have programs different requirements. A little bit. Yeah, but there is generally a, a neurology component as well as an, a big internal medicine component. Um, sometimes they'll also have rheumatology and other subspecialties that we work with really closely as well. Um, and then the other category of uh, residency programs is advanced. This is going to be very similar to your radiology, uh, dermatology, neurology. We're kind of all in the same boat here where your residency program starts on your second year and you have to apply for your first year separately. Yeah. So that is a separate intern year and you apply to both at the same time and come match day you find out where you go for both. So, so theoretically, can you do an, uh, like a prelim here in general surgery and then apply or does it have to be internal medicine or like some specific uh, 
like speciality that you need the prelim year in? You can do a prelim year in whatever you want. Uh, there's mainly three different kinds of prelim years. You have your prelim internal medicine, which is what I'm doing right now. It generally, you're functioning the same as one of your categorical internal medicine colleagues. You can do a prelim general surgery uh, residency, or you can do something called a transitional year where you rotate in a bunch of different departments. It's very similar to doing clinical rotations when you're in medical school, and that's perfectly acceptable. Any of them are adequate for fulfilling that requirement before starting your advanced program. But the thing I want to stress is that you don't have to apply to one and then worry about applying to the other the next year. You apply to both advanced and your prelim years at the same time, and you find out where you're going for your entirety of residency come match day. Okay. So I was very fortunate that I matched into Penn State for a prelim year in internal medicine as well as for the PM&O program. I'm here flexing the your jacket. official jackets that came in like last month. Very yeah. exciting times. Okay. So uh, after you're done with your first year, mm -hmm. what's like second year, like third year, like and fourth year like? Mm -hmm. And when do you apply for fellowships, right? And what, are, what kind of fellowships can you do in PMR? Okay. Yeah. So when you're in your second, third, and fourth year, that's when you get into the nitty gritty of your PMNR training. Mm -hmm. You're going to be rotating in the inpatient rehab hospitals as well as outpatient clinics, and you're going to be a consultant in the acute setting. Um, there are differences between different programs. Some might have a burn unit, some might have a wound clinic affiliated with it. It all depends. I know for my program in particular, Next year, I'm basically going to be the entire time in the inpatient rehab hospital because there's various departments within the hospital. We're very fortunate that we have a pediatric PM&R wing, we have the stroke service, we have the brain injury service, we have the um, spinal cord injury service as well. And so there's also the outpatient clinic component where one of the ACGME requirements is to do the electromyelogram clinic or EMG clinic, yeah. which is a really cool procedure we do. It's diagnostic where we, um, well, the patients don't really like it, unfortunately. We can measure the electrical activity of different nerves and muscles to diagnose different neurodegenerative diseases or um, nerve injuries. Like, like ALS and mm -hmm. uh, gullion barre syndrome. Yep. You can do those procedures by yourself as well? Yes, you can, yeah. uh, as a physiatrist, do those procedures as well, which is something our neurology colleagues also do, mm -hmm. uh, but we're, we're required to do it. We're perfectly capable and licensed to do so once we finish training as well. Okay, and after second year, what happens in third and fourth years? At third and fourth years, at least how the program that I'm in is set up, you're doing a little bit more of outpatient clinics and a little bit more of the uh, console service. So outpatient clinics include pain management, an ortho clinic, mm -hmm. sports medicine clinic, and also clinics for stroke and spinal cord injury and okay. pediatric PM&R. All right. And okay, after this, there's fourth year. What's that like? Okay. It, yeah. So fourth year, uh, you can apply to be a chief. There's two chief positions in my program. Um, it's a, There's opportunities to do research. And there's also still going to be a pretty heavy like outpatient and uh, consult service to it. But you're also still going to be um, rotating through the inpatient rehab side. You, you kind of move through all the different departments to see where you want to form your practice. Um, and you also get to apply to fellowships. Now, the vast majority of fellowships in PM&R are only one year. Only one year? Only one year. That's the best part <laughs> of it because if you were to do internal medicine, most fellowships are like at least two to three years. Mm -hmm. For psych, it's true as well. So just one year. That's mm -hmm. it? Okay. I think there might be exceptions for pediatric PM&R, mm -hmm. but there's also uh, a few programs where you can um, dual uh, board certify in both pediatrics, like general pediatrics, and PM&R. Uh, the University of Cincinnati is an example that comes to mind. Okay. So there's some people who are like really into congenital um, and neurodegenerative rehab children, and there are definitely tons of opportunities in that. I think that's the one fellowship that would be two years, but all the other ones are one year. That's so cool. Yeah. But, yes. yeah, Let's jumping onto fellowships now. Yep, jumping yeah. onto fellowships. You can do pain management and interventional spine. You can do brain injury. Mm -hmm. You can do spinal cord injury. You can do sports medicine. 
Uh, and I know that those are the really big ones and really popular ones. There are some non-ACGME accredited fellowships that are available. Uh, those would be something like cancer rehab, and there's also neuromuscular mm -hmm. diseases. Um, there's also, uh, yeah, there's also fellowships in multiple sclerosis and neurorehabilitation. And those are just the non-ACGME accredited ones. Um, okay. But you can also go into fellowships that may not necessarily come to mind as being PM&R friendly, like palliative care, because most palliative care programs are actually run by the internal medicine department, but mm -hmm. it's definitely viable and a big part of what we do is coming up with uh, goals of care and having those family meetings. That's part of probably my favorite part of PM&R altogether. When you're in that inpatient rehab side, you end up with team meetings with the physical therapist, the nursing staff, the caseworker, and you all come together and discuss what the barriers to discharge are and what we can do to help get people home. Oh, that's that's cool. So jumping onto like something that like piqued my interest was uh, sports medicine. Yeah. So like, does that mean you can work with teams like sports teams and like what what does sports med medicine have in it like? Re the rehab side of like if somebody gets an injury like what happens in sports medicine you actually can do sideline coverage and there are some pmnr doctors who do sports medicine that travel with their teams Damn. to all these different locations and you're there to prepare the athletes before they go on to play and you can also do rehabilitation in case they have an injury and so there is a whole like section of rehabilitation that's related to athletes and like top performers where you can really get into what their body mechanics are after the injury and before the injury to make sure they prevent injuries in the future. And Did not know that. Yeah, but you can wow. do sideline coverage. And a lot of really exciting stuff through PMNR is also adaptive sports, yeah. like Paralympics and things like that, because there is like a whole field out there of all this specialty equipment that allows people to do all these sports in like amazing ways which I get really excited about too. Nice. Uh, okay, so let's talk about like PMR as a lifestyle speciality. Mm -hmm. Like, so during residency, like I know like first year is kind of busy because it's like when you're starting, intern year is always hectic. Mm -hmm. But later on, how's like your lifestyle like? Do you work more or less hours compared to other specialties? Like, is it relaxed or is it like super tense or, and how is the attending lifestyle as well? Okay. Yeah. I can say that the resident lifestyle is pretty nice. Okay. Uh, I was just talking to one of my future seniors and yeah. she was telling me that she has worked six weekends this year. What? Six weekends in a year. That's not a lot. That's not a lot. That's I don't know if that's just like how her schedule turned out, but yeah. it seems to be like it's not particularly hectic. You're not dealing with the super duper acute patients because when it comes to rehab, a person has to be stable enough to tolerate the physical therapy and to be thinking about going home in order for us to have a role really. Mm -hmm. It's appropriate to consult us early, but we're not gonna play a big role until we get closer to discharge okay. and closer to being safe enough to go home. And so a lot of the patients you are dealing with are a little bit more medically stable. So it, there's no such thing as a rehab emergency like I'm not gonna get a call at 2 a.m. when I'm on call and be like we need an evaluation for discharge right now like that's not <laughs> yeah be, that's not practical now I will say sometimes in the rehab hospital mm -hmm. some patients acutely to compensate they might become septic or, or something happens something unexpected medically happens but it is generally not the norm because like I said we're not dealing with super duper acutely ill people we're dealing with people who are a little more stable and they just need a little more help in order for them to improve their quality of life so so it's kind of more relaxed than other specialties in in short rewards right mm -hmm. and uh, let's jump on to the attending lifestyle like how many hours do you guys generally work mm -hmm. uh, per week and you know how's the lifestyle like just just as an attending honestly it is definitely one of the better lifestyle specialties that's out there mm -hmm. because the field is so broad you can pretty much cater your practice to whatever it is that you're interested in and whatever it is that you're looking for 
I know that there are some people who do get involved in academic medicine and they do a lot of research and then maybe not be like super involved in the clinical side. And then there's people who are like traveling and doing sideline covers. There's people who have their own practice in pain management and they'll have days that they're in an outpatient surgery center doing a whole host of injections and things like that. And it really varies a lot, but it is definitely one of the specialties where you can cater it to what your needs are and what your interests are, which is why it's one of the better ones. With uh, like not having to deal with as many as emergencies mm -hmm. as other specialties might have to deal with, which is like makes it a less cortisol spiking specialty, right? Yeah. Because we need a bit less of it in our lives, you know? Definitely. <laughs> Yeah. The, the reason that I picked PMNR, one of the many reasons, because I one really do love okay, it. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's because I, I think it's important to plan for what your career is going to look like in the long run. Being on call when you're 30, okay, you can deal with a night of no sleep. Being yeah. on call when you're 50, now you're pushing it. You're, you're really going to feel that in the morning. Yeah. And I think that's one of the major keys here, that you really don't have call like even people who are on call in general they don't even get called in so unless something catastrophic is happening to your patients in the inpatient rehab side which has happened like talk to any of the residents they have had to deal with the situation where someone all of a sudden went septic but generally it's not the norm it's not the norm yeah jumping boats yeah. uh coming to like you know how much do pmr like after you're done like as a pmr attending mm -hmm. how much do you guys generally make Okay. You know, if you if you're aware of that and mm -hmm. also in fellowships. Yeah. Right? Like what's the max amount you can make if for P and there's no like, you know, we should definitely talk about money. Everybody right. talks about Everyone it. Everyone talks about right? it. Right, it's not taboo. Let's let's do this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. I think I've seen averages in the three hundred thousand dollar something range. Mm -hmm. Um generally if you're looking at like the higher range, you're going to be doing procedures. So this yeah. is talking about pain management, interventional spine. These are the folks who are making more money because if you're doing a procedure, there's generally a better compensation package, just the way that healthcare is set up here in the US. And if you're doing more outpatient stuff, I regret to say it, but sports medicine is not on necessarily on the higher earning part, although okay. they do do some injections and interventions like that. Um, they do, you know, the people who go into it do it because they love it. They love the patient population of all these great athletes and they love to travel and do that sideline coverage, which is really exciting mm -hmm. and not necessary. Some people just have their outpatient sports medicine clinic, um, and they don't necessarily travel, but they see a lot of MSK injuries from people who are in the community and that's a lovely field. So we're, we're looking in the $300,000 range averages, yeah. which is very reasonable. We're neither the most paid nor the least paid. And depending on which subspecialty you go into will affect your compensation. With intervention being the higher paying one. With intervention being the higher paying one, yeah. And to the fellowship question, well, it's whatever the program is paying. Their fellows, they kind of have like a scale. PGY1s make the least amount of money and then it goes up by like two, three grand per year. Mm -hmm. So if we're t a fellow, that would be your PGY5 year. So whatever uh, base rate for your PGY5 at your particular institution is, that's what you're going to get paid. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, that's generally how it goes. I know for our PGY one year here at Penn State, it's like $62,000 and it'll go up two to three grand per year. Um, it, they do adjust uh, a little bit per year, like increases. I think it's like a 3% yeah. increase, like yeah. three to 5% yeah. of what I'm aware, like a thousand dollars more mm -hmm. every single year, thousand to thousand dollars. Yeah. La okay. So how do you uh, apply to PMR, like coming to the like the gist and I think the, the most important best. part of the video is if somebody wants to apply mm -hmm. like what's the step scores they do, do they need like the minimum scores and mm -hmm. okay after that like what should be in their application what electives and what rotations are required to apply yep. to PMR okay absolutely so PMNR, good news, is not super competitive. I think it's because it's a smaller specialty and a lot of people don't even know it exists. Um, there's definitely classmates of mine from medical school who still have no idea what it is that I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> uh, their loss is my gain. Uh, yes. <laughs> the average step one uh, step score, which I know it's pass fail now, but yeah. it was in the two, low 230s, high 28, 220s historically. Yeah. 
like 228 around that or 230 232 whenever you look at the past years and then step two was only a, a, like in the high 230s yeah that's reasonable it's very right, reasonable yeah. it's not particularly competitive what they want you to highlight when you're thinking about getting your application together for pmnr is teamwork because you're going to be working with a lot of different specialists and you're going to be working with a lot of different healthcare professionals like i mm -hmm. said we're really close to our physical therapy friends and occupational therapy friends so any way to highlight teamwork working well with others and having good people skills that's going to be a big priority I would recommend you do a rotation in PMNR if at all possible, yeah. but rotations in things like rheumatology, neurology, ortho, those are going to be very helpful in preparing for it. Ideally, you would have at least one letter of recommendation in the specialty, but there is a good understanding that PMNR is a small specialty. There's only 94 programs thereabouts in the entire United States that do PMNR. Mm -hmm. So they're fairly reasonable as long as they that you're able to show in your personal statement that you know very well what PM&R is and what they have to offer patients and that you're a good fit for it, that's really what's important. So are there like, so how many programs are there for PMR? And like, is there like, for some programs, is there a requirement that you need to have a rotation in PMR? Or like, you, they don't need that, it's just that it's more, uh, you know, it's, it's a good thing to have that. But like, I'm just like curious about that. Okay, so uh, I, last I checked, there were 94 programs in the United States. There might be a few more. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that it is very much recommended. I'm going to go ahead and talk about like the unwritten rules of match. Mm -hmm. One of the things that PM&R people worry about is that they don't want frustrated orthopedic surgeons. Yep. Yeah, because the historically the step scores are a little bit lower, a lot of people who maybe had high hopes of being like ortho surgeons wanted to go into the field but maybe were disappointed when they took their exams and then they're like, "Oh, PM&R is pretty good." And it is. But we want to make sure that this is not like a second choice. That this is something you're actually passionate about. Yeah. So I think it would be very beneficial if you do a rotation there, at least one, because then you can say, I definitely know what PM&R looks like. Um, sometimes that's not possible, especially training in the pandemic. Yeah. So there's not much you can do there, uh, but I, I would definitely recommend it. Doing one rotation. At least one rotation. But um, is it required to have like a LOR from a PMR specialist or no? It's not required. It is preferred. And there are people who match successfully without one. So when I'm applying, do I need like, where should I get my other letters from? Let's say I have like four spots, mm -hmm. right? On like, let's say one PMR and what, where, like what others, like those three should be from what specialty? Okay. It's not as particular about what specialty you get your letters from. Just mm -hmm. make sure they're a good letter writer. It can be from a surgical or medical specialty. It doesn't matter. As you can see, both of these fields really come together when it comes time to talk about PM&R and talk about rehab. Okay. You're going to have those post-op patients. You're going to have medically complex patients. So it really doesn't matter where your other letters come from. It's just, it would be ideal if you had at least one, but even if you don't, that's okay. That's okay, but they should just talk about your interest in PMR, even though they are from another specialty, right? Yeah. Like medicine should talk about like how you're really interested in this side of medicine, which is PMR, mm -hmm. right? Uh, maybe something like that. So it's not required like to have even that one PMR letter, but it's it's a good like, you yeah. know. Yeah, it's a good thing cream, to have. Yeah, cream on the crop or whatever. Yeah. Well, the ice cream with the whipped cream on top or something. Yeah. Oh, it's made me love like cream on the crop. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm going to make that cream on the crop, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. it, it's preferred, but not necessarily Be mandatory quiet. because yeah. everyone understands that it's, it's a small specialty. Now, here are some of the pitfalls. I already talked a little bit about them wanting to make sure you're really passionate about it and this isn't like a second fiddle, second choice. Um, there's also the aspect that everyone knows everyone in PMNR because yeah. it's a small specialty. Everyone that comes to the conferences knows each other. So mm -hmm. lots of different programs know a lot of different other people in programs. So if you're going to do your rotation, really take it seriously and absolutely do your best because if you mess up, um, pretty sure everyone's going to hear about it. But that generally isn't a big concern. 
as long as you're like a nice team player, you're gonna do fine. Yeah, I think it's just that if you misbehave somewhere, mm -hmm. people know about it. People will know. It's because like it's just a, just a small specialty and everybody mm -hmm. talks. Like it's a similar case with psych as well because yeah. everyone knows everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I so, know. I have heard. What what other pitfalls might I expect if I were a candidate applying to BMR? Okay. Um, I think that this is a specialty for people who are laid back, easygoing, flexible, and not in it for the prestige. Like I said, a lot of people don't know what this is. They don't know what we do. And so it's important to have that humility with you. If you're interested in prestige and being the hot shot in the doctor, this is not... At like the hot shot in the hospital, this is not the So that's like orthopedics and plastic surgery. Right. Like not those. necessarily. I'm not calling out any particular specialty here. But if you're someone... Like the mindset of applying, like, you know, yeah. the prestige, like the surgeon is right. the prestigious thing. Yeah. I'm not saying it's like bad on a specialty. I'm just like, it's more of a, like seen as a prestigious thing yes. by other people. Yeah. This is not a prestige seeking Yeah. Like specialty. if you want that validation. Or, right, if you yeah. want that validation and that recognition, you're not going to get it here because people don't know what we do. But that doesn't mean that our patients do not absolutely appreciate and love the services we offer. Honestly, one of the most meaningful times and meaningful moments in my medical training was when I was in a meeting for people who have um, cancer. And one of the patients said, my oncologist keeps me alive but my PM&R doctor makes life worth living. Wow. Yeah, that gave me chills. <laughs> I was like, this is oh a specialty for me. I made the right choice. So I absolutely love what we do. I love the community. I attended some of the conferences and it's just some of the nicest, most down to earth people. And mm. I just want to be around them. Like these are the people I want to work with. Okay, and, and let's say if somebody were to get, like, want to have guidance from you, where could they get in touch with you? Oh, um, well, I can always uh, leave you your email, but I would highly recommend two different organizations. The AAPMR, um, yeah. the American Academy of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation. Yeah. They have a website that's really great for a lot of information and opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the AAP. Not American Academy of Pediatrics. <laughs> I like to call it the less famous AAP, the yeah. uh, Association of Academic Physiatrists. Mm -hmm. um, one of the greatest programs they have there is in the summer, generally between first and second year of uh, U.S. medical school timeline, where you can do a rotation at a different sites that participate and learn about PM&R before you even get into clinical rotations. That's, that's so cool. Yeah, that's something that I did. Okay. And so I ended up learning a lot more about the specialty, and they prioritize students who don't have a home physiatry program okay. so that you they can spread awareness about the specialty. That's their whole goal. So they have that summer program that's like clinical experience, and they also have a research one. So highly recommend checking those two organizations out. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. Would you want to give them your email or not? <laughs> um... Because I don't imagine that a lot of people though still will, but like a few might. And yeah. if they have like, let's say, no idea, if you want, were to give your email, like some side email, like maybe you can answer it and mentor a few people. Yeah, I don't mind mentoring a few people. I've mentored a few people. Um, yeah. I currently have two of my old, uh, like two of the people the year before me or the year after me in med school who are mentoring and they're on the application trail. So I'll mention an email below. Yeah, you can just mention my email below. You look so... I'm so scared. Scared, like, you're like... I'm going to get bombarded with things. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm terrified. Do people email you? All the time. That's, All the time, oh God. Okay, guys. <laughs> by the way, exciting. by the way, thank you so much for watching yeah, and subscribing.